ready to get into God's Word this morning? Did you bring your Bible? It's a quiet crowd this morning. Did you bring your Bible? Are you ready to get into God's Word? I hope so. If you didn't, there's one in front of you. I encourage you. Uh, turn with me to Luke chapter 2. We're going to get into God's Word. We're going to continue on with this series. Uh, we've been looking at the good news of this season. Do you believe that as we go, as we're, as we're in the throes of the Christmas season, that the, that the gospel of Jesus is genuinely good news? Do you see it as exciting? Do you see it, um, when we talk about church, when we talk about being Christians, do you see it as a good thing? Or do you like, uh, got to go to church again today. Got to show up with other people. Got to put a smile on the face. Kids, shut up back there. Stop fighting, right? Is that how you think, you know, how do you see church? How do you see being a Christian? And maybe you're not a Christian yet this morning, and that, that's okay. Hopefully you come to that point of understanding who God is, and the love that he has for you. Um, I don't know about you, but I love Jesus. It's that simple. And, and I hope and I pray that he pours out of my, just that he gushes out of me. And I don't, I'm not embarrassed by that or ashamed by that in any way. It's that simple. And sometimes we complicate it quite a bit, don't we? We complicate being a Christian like crazy. All the rules. Anybody ever grow up thinking, man, all the Christianity is is a bunch of rules. Do's and don'ts. Anybody ever think that? Honestly. Like, slip your hand up if you're like, yeah, I kind of feel like that sometimes. Okay? Okay? A few honest people in the room. There's so many different dynamics. So many different flavors to Christianity. So many different... Ways that we do church. And I know, just looking around, I know some of the stories that some people in the room, you, you, were, you were Catholic, you were Mennonite, you were Methodist, you were Lutheran, and now for some weird reason, you find yourself with us today. Oh, Lord bless you. <laughs> and sometimes we like to pile all kinds of expectations and traditions on who God is, and what Christianity is. And the prime example right there with the nativity scene. You know, many of us think there's really three, you know, kings of Orient are. Bearing gifts, we traverse afar, you know. Uh, and however else the song goes. Um, and all the schoolyard versions of it. We, we like to think that they were all right there at the manger even, Right? And, and sometimes we get little hints of, of things being wrong, but have you ever been frustrated when you realized you were doing something wrong? Uh, I, I didn't share this first service, but I remember trying to change the, um, the rear brakes on our, on our minivan, and I, I parked it, put the emergency brake on, jacked it up, trying to get the drums off, and I'm like, why won't these come on? I'm beating and beating and beating on this thing. And it dawned on me, man, I shouldn't have the emergency brake on. Some of you already caught that. Went and popped the emergency brake, and they, like, fell off. I'm like, no way, this is ridiculous. One of those moments where you absolutely feel dumb, right? That was one of those moments for me. Any mechanic, and some of you are in here, you know, I made sure to include that line, Kate, for all you smart people. Oh, man, I did not feel smart that day. I, and I wish I'd had somebody telling me, no, that's not the way you do it. But there's things that we begin to pile on our lives, and, and it becomes burdensome. I don't know about you, but I feel insanely busy at times. Like, more and more, the, the more I go into life, the more busy I feel. Like, how do I keep up with all of this? And all these and expectations, and, and many of them are self-imposed expectations. I put them on myself. Well, I want people to think good of me. I want people to, to look up to me. I want people to think I'm an okay person. I, you know, all these expectations. Oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. You know, for my family, for my friends, for the church. All these things. And, and we build these, these burdens almost in life. Do you know what I'm talking about? Anybody connected with me this morning? We put all these things on and it just gets heavy. 
It's like, oh, I don't know if I can handle this anymore. And some of the things, honestly, I think we do them sometimes to impress God. Well, if I do this, God will be impressed with me, and maybe I can earn my way into heaven. In fact, I was just talking with somebody, uh, their friend on Facebook had filled out a Facebook survey that balances out your good deeds versus your bad deeds, some, some good deed survey, and this person had like 108 good deeds to 40 bad deeds. So like, sweet, you're 60% extra going to heaven. I'm like, what? And that's some of the thinking that goes around, and it's, it's so easily, intentionally or unintentionally, it wiggles into our life, doesn't it? And then we begin to wonder, if I were to die today, would I go to heaven? And anybody besides me ever doubt that? You wonder, if I were to die today, would I go to heaven or not? And sometimes it's a scary thought that can motivate us. In fact, I would say that even some, some churches will use that question to motivate you through guilt and fear to do certain things. Because that's a big pusher. I don't want to be in hell. And if I listen to a religious person that says, well, if you just do this, then you won't go to hell, I might consider doing that. But that's how many times we live. In fact, we, we, uh, we, we bring on all these things, these projectors and lights and presents and stage props, all in an effort to make it look good and convince people to be in love with God. And when we did this first time, I'll try it this time. Turn off the, sp- the screens and turn off the lights and just leave the front row on. Could we do church without all the extra bells and whistles? Absolutely. We could do it in the dark. Although I like to see whether you're sleeping or not. <laughs> I'll just stay close in case we need to smack someone on the back of the head. We don't need the bells and whistles. We don't need all those things to worship God. We almost had like absolute technical failure first, you know, in, in the second service here. And words weren't on the screen because it was just kind of falling apart. And it's like, we, you know, can you still sing and worship Jesus without the words on a screen or printed in a book in front of you? Right? Can you still listen to a preacher even though he's got the, an ugly sweater on? Right? Well, where's his suit? Right? <laughs> Sometimes we're motivated by some false things that, that don't get us any closer to God. Wearing this gets me no closer to God. I'm hoping he'll laugh at me a little bit. <laughs> like, look at that. What is wrong with those people? You know? Or maybe like, good job, guys. You know? <laughs> Has no eternal impact, but it's fun. Should we be able to have fun in church? Should we be able to love God and love other people around us and have a good time doing it? Yeah? Should we be able to be on purpose and on mission and still enjoy each other's company? I hope so. I really hope so. But oftentimes, we, we get this mindset of fear of God. What if God doesn't approve of me? In fact, we make prayers about it. I mentioned this in first service that oftentimes when we pray with our kids, especially when they're really little, we, we, don't, we used to do this when our kids were little. We stopped doing it now because it's a creepy prayer. Maybe you've prayed this before, but you prayed that prayer where your kids are, you know, you kneel down by the bed or they're laying on the bed and, and you kneel down by him and you say, now I lay me, right, down to sleep. That's a cute little prayer. I pray the Lord, my soul to keep. Oh, it's so beautiful, right? If I should die, right, before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take, right? Good night, kids. Sleep good. <laughs> the kid's like, keep the lights on, Dad. This is scary. Right? You ever wonder, like, what if I die today? The beautiful thing that I think that we have about Jesus and the simplicity of the story with Him coming is that you cannot earn your way to God. You can't work your way to God. God came to you and He finished the work. All we do is believe and trust. Oh, but it couldn't be that simple, Pastor. There's no way it's sim- that simple, Amos, right? It's got to be more complicated. I've got to do this and I've got to do that. I've got to give tithe in church. I've got to uh, attend every service when the doors are open. I, I have to shake every hand and have a smile on my face. I've got to do all these religious traditions. And I would push back on that and say, 
Some of those things are important, but they're not what gets you saved. They're not what makes you right with God. Are you tracking with me this morning? But some of us were like, well, okay, so maybe it's not about doing good things, but as long as I do more th- good things than the person next to me, right? As long as you look to the person next to you and say, as long as I'm better than you, can you turn to them and say that? As long as I'm better than you, then I'm okay. How many people think that, right? It's like a bear in the woods, right? And you and your buddy. I don't have to outrun the bear. I just got to outrun you, right? And how many times is that our perspective towards God? Like, God, you could send them to hell, but don't send me. Because I was a little bit better than them. I, did, I, went to, I went to church a little more often. I dressed fancier than they did. I'm going to get some lights back on up here. I would leave the lights off, but I see some people yawning, and I'm like, eh, I don't know. In this series, we're talking about how it really is good news. It's not as complicated as we think to be a Christian. God's not this big cosmic killjoy. The first week we talked about how your mama would tell things to you, right, when you were a kid. Remember that? Mama would say, put your, put, put your earmuffs on, right, when you go outside. Because your mama didn't want you to die of ear infection. Mm. Right? Um, don't go running out in the street. Mama say that because she hates you? She said that because she loves you, right? So we see that. And then uh, we talked about how sometimes we do things in life that we think they're good at the time. Seem like a good idea, right? Or as the popular phrase goes now, you know, hold my beer while I try this, right? Isn't that how it goes? And then somebody does something really, really dumb. (laughs) We we call them Darwin Award recipients because they end up cleansing the gene pool. Um, Some of you will get that later. (laughs) But I I don't know about you, I feel, I've, those times when you realize you've been doing something wrong, and it's, sometimes it's, oh man, I'm a dummy. And other times it's just absolutely freeing. And I pray that this message today is absolutely freeing to you. I love reading Matthew chapter 23. Uh, I love how Jesus gets in the face of some of the things that we've traditionally held on to and expected. And it gets in the face of religious leaders. And if you ever get a, get a chance, read Matthew chapter 23. Uh, it's a, a powerful passage. But when we think about Jesus, Jesus didn't come to bring despair. He came to bring hope. Hope for your future. Okay, If you believe in evolution, where's the hope in that? You're just going to die and go back to the dirt. Okay, That's all there is to it. He came to bring peace. I don't believe that that Jesus came to cause uh, war and division. I, br- I believe that if we surrender our hearts to him, if our world surrendered their hearts to Jesus, it would transform this planet. He came to bring love, not hate. He came to bring joy, not sorrow. Even in the midst of hard things. That's what I want you to understand. Now, don't take this as a, uh, a prosperity preaching this morning, Okay. If you come to church, Jesus is going to fill your bank account. He's going to give you a Cadillac, and and everybody in your family is going to sing Kumbaya. That's not how it happens. You will. In fact, I promise you, the more you press in on Jesus, the harder things may get. But you will have a peace in all of it. You will have a joy in all of it. I love this. There's a couple. I wanted to show a couple of pictures. We're going to have some fun with this. There's a couple of pictures. I just like showing these things. When, those moments when somebody should tell you you're doing it wrong, somebody needs to tell that guy. That's not how you use that machine, right? Instead of telling him, they just took a picture because it's way more entertaining that way. Next one, right? I have no idea what this guy's even doing. I actually have no idea what the machine is either, um, but that's okay. Next one. See, and, and like we said, first service, this is why women live longer, Right? Men, we do some dumb stuff, right? Is he getting the job done? Yes. <laughs> right, next one. I had literally had to look at this picture for five minutes, and there was at least a dozen things wrong with this picture, Not, including the structural modifications they made to that building to jack up those platforms. 
yeah, this is fine, although he's not looking. It's fine until she realizes that he's worth more with his life insurance policy, and she just lets go, right? <laughs> we got another one. This guy just needs help. <laughs> he just needs help. Sometimes we feel like that in life, don't we? Like, I can't hold all of this stuff up. Or people will literally, they'll, they'll see even, we'll put weights on people like that in religious terms. You say, here, and, and Jesus specifically said this in Matthew 23. He said, you put all these heavy weights on people, which you yourself can't hold up, and you expect them to do it. And why do you think people cast off Christianity? Like this guy needs to cast off his weight. Because we, we put on, we impose all these co- concepts of what Christianity is. Christianity, I'll say this around, Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship. And I don't know about you, but I love my wife. And she's not a burden. I enjoy being with her. That is not my relationship with my wife. (laughs) We got another one, I think. A guy sitting on another guy's shoulders, I would not want to be the guy underneath there. Well, the guy above me has a chainsaw running. No. Next one. This one, I think, is one of the best pictures when it comes to how we oftentimes perceive our faith and perceive God. If I stack the tables right and I get going up there and I climb up to the top and I put a ladder, then maybe I can achieve what God wants me to achieve. How many times do we have that perspective in our faith or in our religious perspective? It almost reminds me of the Tower of Babel. Just confusing. Is there one more after that? I think there was one more. Riding on the back. <laughs> is that a Ford? <laughs> I loved it, actually. One of the guys came in first service. He's like, I wanted to get an ugly sweater for, for, to wear today, but I couldn't find one that said Chevy on it. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> have some fun with that. But... Even when it comes to our faith, how many times do we treat it like that? I'm just trucking along in life, and there's some tag along with a big weight on top of me trying to hold on desperately. And that's my faith right there. I don't think that communicates it well at all. In fact, if we read, you can, put, you can take those off of there. Uh, <laughs> if, you, if you felt like maybe not very intelligent coming in and seeing those, if you wouldn't do that, at least now you can leave a little more intelligent, right? Thank you for not trying that. Um, Luke chapter 2, verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby. Jan just read this a little bit ago. Keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Terrified. Can you imagine that? They were scared out of their minds. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. (laughs) Every time I read that, like I mentioned in the first service, every time I read that, I always have a Canadian accent stuck in my mind. I have no idea why. Do not be, af- do not be afraid, eh? Do not be afraid, eh? Eh? Do not be afraid. I don't know. I'm just messed up like that sometimes. I bring you good news. That's not even Canadian. That they will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This was tremendous news. Great joy. And I hope and I pray that when you think about your faith and your love for Jesus, that it goes beyond religion. Sometimes we do things, though, just out of, uh, oh, I was going to, I mentioned this first service. I wanted to mention it this time. Um, I don't even know if this is true, but yesterday we were having lunch with some of Mel's family, and they were talking about this woman that every year for Christmas, she would cut her ham in half. Have you heard about this? she cut her ham in half every year. And people would be like, why do you do that? I don't know. My mom always did it. And she just every cut it in half, cook it up. Cut it in half, cook it up. Like, why do you do that? Finally, she, she called her mom to say, Mom, why is it that you cut the ham in half? Is there some kind of cooking technique and trick? And she, mom chuckles. She's like, no. My pan wasn't big enough to hold the whole ham at the time, so I started cutting it in half. So some of those things we do, like, why are you still doing it? 
You know what I'm talking about? There's certain things we just hold on to. Does Advent make us a better church? Does doing and lighting these bulbs up make us a better church? No. Does having screens and words on it make a better church? Make us more holy? No. None of that stuff does. In fact, I would, I'd, I'd ask you this question. Is this room a holy sanctuary unto God? I see some people, like, I don't know how to respond to this one. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. We, it's set apart, and yeah, it's blessed. We prayed over it, all that kind of stuff, absolutely. Yep. In some senses of the word, yes, absolutely. Um, but ultimately, and I believe this is what Jesus came to change, is that um, when Jesus died on the cross, what happened in the temple? The veil was torn, right? It was split open. Direct access to God, right? After Jesus ascended and the disciples went into, into uh, Jerusalem and they, and they waited and the gift of the Father was poured out, the, and I would say this, the, the temple, the holy place, the holy of holies is no longer in this building. It's right here in your heart. Is, this, is it a special place? Yeah. It's a place where we can gather together. We can encourage one another. But you are the temple. You are the Holy you are, And the Bible says you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So it's not about, well, I'm going to act all holy when I go into the temple, when I go into the church. But now that I'm not in the church, I can be whatever I want, whatever kind of hellion I'd like to be. No. That's not how it works. Okay? It's that, that whole concept of hypocrisy. An actor would put on a mask, and while he's on the stage, he behaves a certain way. But then when he takes off the mask and he goes home, he's not expected to behave that way. When you, the way you act in church should be the way you are all the time. And hopefully, you're allowing God to transform you. But, but I, I love this. Why was it that the angels showed up to shepherds? I know why. I don't think I want to tell you why this morning. You know why the angels showed up to shepherds? Maybe we will tell you. I believe that the shepherds are an excellent portrayal of who we are. The shepherds were normal people. In fact, I would even say the shepherds were the rejected people. They were the people that nobody else wanted to be around. We kind of mentioned this a little bit last week. Um, the shepherds were just common folk. In fact, Oftentimes, the shepherds were these people that were rejected from society, so they felt undeserving. They felt insufficient. They felt unloved because society was rejecting them. In fact, in the Mishnah, which is this uh, written-down version of the oral tradition of the Jewish people, it actually says in, in, in this, this oral law, one passage describes shepherds as being incompetent. And another one says that no one should ever feel obligated to rescue a shepherd who has fallen into a pit. That's messed up, isn't it? Right? You're driving along in the road and you see somebody spin around in the, in the ditch and on the, uh, on the side of their car it says, I heard sheep. And you go, oh, don't have to worry about them, whatever. You know? And these are the kind of people that Jesus decides to send his angels down to make proclamation but one of the things that i want you to get is wh why did we need jesus why did jesus even need to come it says it says in that scripture that we just read don't be afraid i bring you good news news that will cause great joy for all people today in the town of david a savior has been born he's the messiah a savior why do we need a savior do you need a savior i need a savior because until we come to a point of recognizing that we're sinners, we're not going to see our need for a Savior. You heard that before? Okay, that's not unique to me. That's been around for a while. And it's, tr it's as true as the first time it was ever said. And just because it's tr Christmas, I want to make sure that we all understand how bad of sinners we are. Merry Christmas to you. We're going to go through a little exercise that some of you have heard before. We've done this a couple of times. How many of you in this room have ever told a lie? Raise your hand up. Raise your hand up high if you've ever told a lie. Okay? If somebody next to you isn't raising their hand, 
look at them and say, liar. Liar. Isn't that fun to call somebody a liar in church just this time? Right? Okay. Now, how many of you have ever stolen anything? Anything. A paper clip from work. A quarter off your, out of your kid's piggy bank. You wouldn't do that. That'd be, that's messed up. If you've done that, that's messed up. Right? You've stolen anything in your life. Okay. Okay. Now, this one don't raise your hand for because maybe this is a little more intimidating. But, but ever, do, all you got to do for this one is just kind of like, lift, just, just like that. Okay? You ever thought lustfully about any other person? Just, you know, even pinky. Just, I, I, I see that. A bunch, bunch of people in the room. Okay? So, just in case you were wondering, the Bible says that if you've, com- if you've broken one law, you've broken what? All of them. You're guilty of all of them. The full weight of the law rests on your shoulders if you've broken one of them. And, how, and, and, and most of you in this room raise your hand for any one of those, that makes this church full of lying, thieving adulterers. <laughs> Merry Christmas, what a message of hope, right? And the reason I say that is because it communicates something that we need to understand. By myself, I am broken and inadequate to ever stand before God. But because of Jesus, the good news of Jesus, the great joy that he brings... I have my salvation in him, in him, and him alone. Because many people here this morning, you come to church with brokenness in your life. Whether you've gone through a divorce and the pain that that brings, or your kids are rebelling, or you're in financial ruin, or you just hate your job, or whatever is going on in your life, and you just feel broken, you feel unloved, you feel inadequate. That's where we, find, where we find ourselves many times. Now, for the shepherds, the religious system didn't work. And the religious system for us doesn't work either. Because for, for, for a shepherd, what days of the week did they work? Every single day. Because those stubborn sheep, they'd wander off, wouldn't they? Any... any, any uh, Farmers in here that deal with animals, you know, you have to tend to those things every day. You have to always look after them, even on a Sabbath, even on a holy day, which meant the shepherds were unworthy. They were unclean. They broke the law, the religious law. So this religious system was failing them. And I would say that the religious system that, that, are, that people have built up is failing the church. It's failing the work. Jesus never came to establish religion. He came to undo religion and restore relationship. Are you getting that this morning, church? And that is a message of hope. It's a message of hope. Put down the weights. Jesus said, my, my, uh, my burden is easy. My yoke is light. But it's worth it. I love this, uh, this uh, passage out of Romans chapter 3, verse 20. It says, No one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us what? How sinful we are. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. So how are you made right with God? What what religious deeds do you need to do? None. And just let that set in. You don't have to do anything for God to love you. He already does. And the only thing that you can do to be saved is to accept what he did. I don't know about you, but that's good news. Now, does that mean I don't do anything good? Of course it doesn't mean that. Okay, but we're going to unpack that. So if you're, if you're taking notes, number one, obeying the law will never make you right with God. So any religious leader, big tall hat, nice flowing robe, gold finger on his, or gold ring on his finger, finger, <laughs> gold ring on his finger says, kiss my ring. No. I, I want nothing to do with that. In fact, I think it breaks 
Jesus' heart when he sees the things that we try to put on other people. You need to behave this certain way. You need to do that. 613 laws that religion failed them. Now, now, does that mean that Jesus came to do away with all the Old Testament laws? No. He fulfilled them. He achieved what they were trying to achieve. When he gave us the Ten Commandments, he gave that because he doesn't want anything between you and him. God doesn't want your, uh, your sacrifice. He doesn't want all these things that you can do. He wants your heart. When you leave this place, do you give him your heart? Do you give him your being? Okay, we're not talking, we're talking spirituality, not religiosity. The law was given to show us our desperate need for a savior. We talked about that. That we, we've all broken the law in some way. We need a savior who can undo that. And number three, righteousness with God comes by faith in Christ alone. Faith through Jesus alone. It's, it's really that simple. It's not re- Jesus plus religion. It's not Jesus plus good works. It's not Jesus plus giving to the church or Jesus plus attendance. It's Jesus alone. Why do we do those other things? Because we love Jesus. When, when you see somebody going through a hard time, do you pray with them? We should, because we love Jesus, not because we have to. Do our good works matter? Yes, they do, but not for salvation. Why, why do you do good works? Because you're saved, not in order to get saved. There's a big difference. And it's caused a lot of division within even church circles. Am I making this stuff up? This is out of God's word. There's a lot more passages to this. Now, is religion completely useless? Jesus, the Bible does talk about some that's useful. Helping out widows and orphans and keeping yourself pure from being polluted by the world. That's what, what, the, what, what is identified as religion that is useful. But not this stuff that puts burdens and heavy weights on people. And number four, Jesus restores by Holy Spirit revolution, not religious rituals. Okay, it's not about me taking on more traditions and more rituals that i got to do. It's about me opening my heart to the Holy Spirit and allowing him to wash and transform me. And I would ask you this morning, are you, uh, are you allowing him to do that in your life? Are you praying every day, God, wash over me, God, change me, God, transform me. Because it's Christ plus nothing else. I want you to get this. Religion is about what you do. Relationship is about what Jesus has done. Religion is about me. And look at me standing up here. Look at my authority, right? Better respect my authority. That's religion. Whereas relationship says... God wants to empower, Joe, God wants to empower you to be a man of God to live your life on fire for him. You understand that? Phil, God wants to empower you to be a man of God to live your life for him. Mike, same thing. Every person in this room, it's not about me as some pastor up here. We've talked about this before. Are you taking ownership of your own faith? Are you living this out? Because there's so much blessing in it. I get so excited about this. I love this concept. When Jesus, I, just, I picture before Luke chapter 2, and we're going we're gonna to wrap up with this. In Luke chapter 2, before that took place, I imagine Jesus sitting up in heaven, gathering some of the angels around and saying, come on in guys. Come on in. We're going to talk about how we're going to do this whole introducing me to the world thing. You imagine the angel sitting around with Jesus, and he's like, so what do you guys think? How should we do this? And the angel, you know, Michael being like, hey, let's just like blast through the walls of the temple, and ta-da, right? Or Gabriel being like, let's show up in the palace, and let's just woo the king and say we're coming to take over your kingdom, right? The angel's like, there's power. And Jesus is like, nah. Let's not do it that way. I'm going to be born as a little baby. And I'm going to whine and cry a little bit. And Mary's going to have to change my diapers. And the angels are like, what? 
Really? Yeah. Well, can we still show up to the kings? No, no, don't do that. I want you to show up to the shepherds. I want you to show up to the nobodies, to the people that nobody else accepts, to the people that, that are overburdened, overworked, feel like religion has failed them. I want you to show up to them. Why would, why would they do that? Why, why wouldn't he just show up to the religious leaders? Honestly, I think because if he had, it would have given that much more for religion to brag about. But instead, when Jesus shows up and makes proclamation to the ones that have been failed by the system, it breeds such life and hope to the rest of us. Anybody in the room feel like you just got a normal, everyday job? Even if that's being a mom at home, or, or uh, just trying to stay healthy and strong, right? Most of us don't feel like Man, I'm somebody. I'm somebody special. If that's what you're thinking this morning, you're like, ask that one, Pastor, so I can raise my hand. <laughs> there might be some praying that needs to happen and some repenting of uh, pride there. If you, <laughs> we watched a video um, about a, a preacher going off on his congregation. If you ever want to just make your blood boil, I don't even know what it was called, Preacher Rant or something. What was it called, Andrew? Because you have it, like, memorized. What's that? Jim Standrich? Standrich throws a hissy fit. Yeah, so a preacher throws a hissy fit. He's literally standing up in front of the church. You know I'm something, right? You know I'm something, right? And, and, and Andrew could literally go into a full rant on this, but he uh, it blew my mind. Um, <laughs> he, he walks up to a couple... Um, Mike and Kathy, I'm going to pick on you guys. Uh, because he walks up and he's like, when's the last time I saw you guys in church? Right? I haven't seen you guys in church in a while. I'm supposed to marry you two? I don't think you're, you're, you're not even worth a nickel. Right? Literally in front of the church. How humiliating would that be? Probably don't even like that I'm putting you on the spot right now. Right? <laughs> At least you would. He did, the guy sat there. And his pastor's going off. And I'm thinking, this is where religion has failed. And, and it just, it broke my heart to see the attitude in this, in this figure that was supposed to be leading people into the love and grace and mercy. Most of us in this room, if we were to really push into your story, you've got some brokenness in your life, don't you? You've got some hurts that have happened. Do you need some religious leader making you feel all the more guilty for that? No. No. Instead... We've got this Savior that enters into your world in all of its messiness, laid in an animal's feeding trough. And he completely changes history. So I would ask you, what are some things that you've brought into your life that we hold on to that make your faith heavy, make it burdensome? but then be able to speak into people's lives. Maybe like, Pastor, I get this. I understand what you're talking about. I believe that this is how Jesus has it for us, but how are you sharing that good news with people? How are you telling other people that Jesus loves you just where you are and he has better things in store for you? That's the power of this message that the Christ child brings. Hope, peace, joy and love and it's a beautiful thing if you'd stand with me this morning i think in just a minute we're going to be eating which is a whole nother joyful thing sport your ugly sweaters a little bit with each other if you wore them but i want you to think about this as we go from here today and maybe you get this message maybe you get this concept that it's not about the law it's not about religion, it's about that relationship. Are you sharing that with other people? Is it real in your life? Heavenly Father, I pray right now over this church, over each of us. Lord, I pray that you would be so real in our hearts. I pray that your love that you have for us, no matter how much we think we've blown it or messed up, 
No matter how many times some guy has told a gal, you're worthless, I don't want you. Or how many times kids have pushed back and rebelled, and yet you still love them as a parent. Father, I pray that you begin to bring that joy and that peace into our hearts. Father, right now I pray your Holy Spirit would wash over this place. That you'd do a transforming work in our hearts. Father, that you would even ignite within us a spark to go into all the world, like your word says in Matthew 28, to go into all the world, to preach the good news, to see people get baptized, to see lives transformed through discipleship, mentoring. Lord, that when we leave this place, we would be your church, people in love with you. And we would not look to some religious institution but to personal relationship. That we would see this time that we come together as encouragement. And I would ask you, church, this morning, if there's anything in your life that you've been holding on to and putting, it's been getting in the way between you and God and you say, I need to give this up. And I need to let God be first and foremost in my life. If there's anything in your life that God would be bringing to your mind, any lies that have been spoken over you, any traditions you've held on to, not even knowing why you do. Just lift your hand up and kind of lift it before the Lord, saying, God, I give it all to you. I even give my, what I would see as normal church expectations, how we dress, how we behave. We give it to you, Lord. Thank you for your love. Pray that from this day forward, the relationship that we have with you would grow, that it would multiply, and that we would see transformation in our lives like never before. As we honor you and love you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.